Welcome to Hedge Interview, the essential listen for private fund managers committed to operational excellence. This episode is crucial because it goes beyond the surface of what you think you know about securities law. I'm joined today by Ron Geffner, a founding member and partner of Satis and Goldberg. If you're not already familiar with Ron, he's a much sought after securities lawyer whose expertise and insights have helped hundreds of private fund managers. Ron regularly structures, organizes, and counsels pretty much every type of private investment vehicle, as well as investment advisory organizations, broker dealers, commodity pool operators, and other investment fiduciaries. With his broad background in federal and state securities laws, Ron has pretty much seen everything under the sun. He's regularly quoted and featured by financial media giants like CNBC, Bloomberg, the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, Reuters, and many others. So Ron, it's an honor to have you here today. Thank you for joining me. Jennifer, it's a pleasure to be here. So thanks for having me. So my first question is, how should a fund manager pick a lawyer? That's a really great question and a very difficult one to answer. So I'll give you the best job I can do here on this. First and foremost, go with your intuition and gut. We start off with getting names of references from people we respect, trust, or have worked with. Call the lawyer. Most likely, my experience is people call more than one lawyer. Have a conversation with them. What's your initial reaction? Do they communicate in a manner that resonates with you? Do you feel appreciated, respected, or do you feel commoditized? Just go with the very basics of any any type of person you might engage when considering, and don't solely rely on reputation alone. It's a personal connection. Two, work with people who have the requisite experience. Plenty of times, I mean, I've met managers who hired somebody that they know through family or friends who this was not their area of focus. So mm. the, way, the way people discuss is, would you go to a brain surgeon who's done five surgeries or would you rather go to somebody who's done several a day? So as your intro said, I've been around the block a little bit. I mean, possibly can tell by the color of my hair. And I started my career at the SEC where I used to prosecute money managers in New York. And after having founded Satis, we've overseen the launch of over a thousand private funds. So we have the experience and it's not just, it's not a one person show. There is a team. We have, I have several partners in the financial services group, several associates, we have tax and ERISA, regulatory and compliance. That's on the fun lunch. Second or third thing, depending on how you count, would be what is their reputation in the marketplace? What conflicts of interest might they have that could harm me in the future? So by way of background, Satis is very focused on representing the buy side of the industry and not the sell side. While there are exceptions, our focus is predominantly representing the asset manager. We also have an active litigation team, which while you would think isn't needed, we often handle valuation disputes or claims, shareholder activism, counterparty issues. So that's where the conflicts of interest plays an important role. And then it goes down to the concept, as I said, it's a team. And it's not just, um, it's not just hiring somebody to launch your product. It's hiring somebody to launch and be with you throughout the life of your product. And that's a mistake people often make where I'll get calls and they've used a lawyer who doesn't really know what they're doing. And the easiest way to resolve that problem is unfortunately to, to start fresh. It's more economically efficient. So it's thinking about your business through the life arc of the, of the business, not just that immediate moment. And that was sort of my next question is when somebody hires you, they might think I need, I need, an attorney to help me launch my fund, but what are what do they find out that they usually don't know initially about what comes after the launch? What are things that um, where you are helpful beyond the fund launch that they bump into? Oh, I, I need it. You know, I need to call Ron for this. What are some of those um, types of issues? So another good question. So one of there, there's two components to that. Some of this actually occurs at the fund launch. We often negotiate the terms of the administration agreement if a party is engaging a third-party administrator. Depending on the size of the launch and their economic viability pre-launch, often we will review their agreement with a prime broker and highlight for them, even if it's not negotiable, highlight 
the areas of risk that they should be aware so they can issue spot. This became really apparent post the failures of Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers, where we had clients who really did not understand counterparty risk, then wanted to know if this, then what? And we sensitize them to issues that arise. It's ongoing changes in the regulations, private fund advisors rule, managers need ongoing guidance, changes in tax law. On top of it, we handle employment agreements for managers that have employees that are bringing on, for managers that have partners, drafting partnership agreements. One of the things that I believe distinguishes um, our firm and me in particular, I founded a business. I know what it's like to start with nothing. When I founded Satis, I had 30,000 in business. So I know what it's like to go home every day and sweat the viability of your business. And that just to, so you can all rest calm, it only lasts for about 15 years, that paranoia and fear. <laughs> After that, I'm numb to it. But that being said, it's it's really having empathy and identity and, and being relatable to your client and understanding their issues because it's not one size fits all. Everybody has blind spots and weak spots. And what I often tell people is I'm going to be your least expensive partner. And I would always advise that no matter who you hire, your auditor, your administrator, as best as you can, you're not hiring institutions, you're hiring people. So that's really relevant. It's having business understanding. If you're going to engage a third party marker or replacement agent, not only knowing the commercial terms, but knowing how to diligence those parties out. If you want to expand to other parts of the world, having the right contacts and relationships really does make a difference. It makes it a much more seamless experience. Right. That was something that I heard from um, another guest uh, about um, service provider contracts and how often fund managers just kind of sign on the line, dotted line, and they don't really even understand the agreements they get into. And, and then they, you know, have headaches or misgivings because they didn't really, but I suppose if they had you, they would know what they were getting into. I would hope, but yeah. the reality is a lot of managers haven't run a business. Right. They've worked within an institution. And running a business is its own experience. So in part, I feel that I often am involved on the business side with our clientele because it's subjective. It's an opinion and it's how to deal with people, de-escalate certain situations. And as any other business owner, we made and I made plenty of mistakes the first 20 years of our business. How um, Compensating people ahead of performance, right? giving them the carrot, not the stick, to understanding termination for cause and creating greater clarity, knowing not so what one of the learning curves I had as a lawyer when I was younger. So I'm a people pleaser. So clients would come and they wanted, they would be, I want you to do A through J and bushy tail and bright eyes practicing law. This is pre Satis and Goldberg. I was happy to accommodate. And now you learn when people ask for things, they don't always understand the implications of what it is they're asking for. So part of it is having the acumen and the experience to say, well, look, this might be a more likely end result of this decision process. Is that what you're trying to achieve? Focus on the business aspects and we can guide you. And so you mentioned that there's not one size fits all, but is there a somewhat typical process to launching a fund? The process most of the time is similar. It starts with, we try to understand what's your investment strategy, where do you anticipate raising dollar one from, or for the first six months? In other words, despite what we might expect to occur 12 months from now or later, it's not predictable. No one really knows exactly what's going on with the market. And if they do, they're going to need some really good regulatory defense counsel and criminal counsel, possibly. So the point is, it's we start with a process of going through, tell us about your strategy. Where is dollar one coming from? Do you have other partners? Why do, have, why do you uh, ask that? Why why would why does that matter in your context? Where, where does the dollar one come from? Yeah. Well, I need to understand whether we're going to structure a domestic fund and offshore. Ah, okay. Is the is the offshore now historically, if you went back 10 years, offshore money was offshore money. Nowadays it's not. Is the money coming from the EU? Is the money coming from Canada? Is the money coming from, and you can go on litany of the different triggers that occur by virtue of where the money emanates from. Then if you went back 20 years, I used to ask people, are you managing your strategy in a tax efficient manner? 
because that also influenced how we structured funds, mm -hmm. whether side-by-side -side structures versus master feeder. I think I only know of one client off, off top of my head that manages assets in a tax-efficient manner. Um, another interesting question since 2008 in particular, and I, I say 2008 because prior to 2008, the liquidity features of fund documents didn't always match up with the liquidity features of the portfolio. Mm. And managers really just wanted to structure funds that they thought were easily marketed in an effort to attract capital and not what long-term might've been best for the LP or investor. With regard to where you located and your partners and your employees, that'll help us determine what regulatory requirements we might have in the event you have to register as an investment advisor. With regard to also determining whether the liquidity features of the portfolio, one structure may not be sufficient, meaning if you were 50-50 of liquid securities and level three assets that are illiquid and hard to value, that changes how you structure the fund because every time money comes in or out of the vehicle, you need to strike an NAV. So by way of example, if you were to invest in the fund and your investment was a million dollars, congratulations, Jen, you just got, you just won a million dollars. And hey, so, <laughs> and then, and the next investor is coming in with another million dollars. And let's say the portfolio um, was hard to value. If, if you were to value it conservatively, meaning, you know what, I'm just going to market a cost and, if they're unrealized gains, um, it's and it's not necessarily clear based on where the, the the price of the underlying asset is moving, or based on prior comps. Then the person coming in might benefit, but you would be diluted unfairly if it's priced conservatively. If it's priced aggressively, while you benefit, the incoming investors harmed, mm. and that is a high area of risk on the valuation of the NAV. So that's really important to make sure that the features of the fund documents match up with the features of the portfolio. So and that basically really clear by like, way with crypto, like crypto, that became an issue. Mm -hmm. Cannabis right. became an issue. Asset back lending and other strategies. Started, why, those, why is that an issue for them in particular? Well, um, well, with crypto, not every, first of all, there's a range of issues that have come about with crypto. Mm. If it's a level three asset, not a, Auditors were not always able to value the underlying portfolio. Oh, actually. right. Or, or if it was um, a rant, like an, an NFT. So we mm -hmm. might, if it's a hedge fund, knowing that in advance, we would we would suggest they create side pockets. But if the majority of the assets are going to be invested there, what we've experienced over the years is having a fund structured solely with side pockets also has downsides to it as well, and it's not feasible. And you would see, if you went back over the last 20 years and you look at funds that were formed doing life settlement, asset back lending, or alternative finance. The ones that were structured as hedge funds were, were dealing with a range of issues that in a going forward basis, a closed end fund or private equity structure would probably have been better for them and really better for their investors. Right. So it's really a matter of delivering on what you say you're going to do. But that goes back to the ongoing relationship you have with your vendors, not just lawyers. Mm -hmm. And I would tell you, the auditor and the administrator become the eyes and ears of the lawyers because they might deal with them at times more on a day-to-day -day basis and they, they become issue spotters. Right. So um, strategies evolve. Mm -hmm. If you went back 15 years ago and 10 years ago, crypto and cannabis would not have played a role. AI is becoming a newer feature that will affect the industry. So it's knowing how to deal with it in your structuring, in your valuation policies and procedures, in your agreements with counterparties, all that really is tied in with one another. And managers, they um, reasonably or justifiably are not going to be familiar with all the regulatory issues. If you're rebalancing a portfolio, it could be a principal transaction. There's a lot of different things that have a regulatory impact. Are there typical big mistakes? Tell us some good juicy stories. Wow, Without there's... naming names. <laughs> okay, so here's a really basic mistake that managers often make. I'll give you the most simplistic form of how it appears. We launch your fund, Jennifer, 
and you decide to move from lovely, luscious garden-like landscape that's behind you to the big, big city of New York City. And you sit there and say, you know what? My lawyer drafted my document three years ago. I don't need to contact him, have him charge me thousands of dollars just to go in and change my address in the place memo. So you go into the place memo and it's 2024 and it was dated 2021. You change, you update your address, you redate the place memo 2024 and you're like, you're good to go. But if I had a big red buzzer or like that Staples giant red button or a big X go across the screen, I'd slam it right about now. But what you then need to do, what you did is does not work. You either do a supplement because all of the information in that place memo dated 2021 is only relevant as of 2021. Mm -hmm. So if you redated 2024 and you send it out to Jeff Bezos, who's writing a check in your fund, your tax information may be wrong. The regulatory information may be wrong. The way your biography was written, risk factors, all might have needed to be updated to 2024. And makes sense. it might be years sometimes before they contact their lawyer. And they've done this two or three times. Maybe somebody's mm. biography in the fund, they're no longer there or somebody joined. A vendor, they didn't even switch vendors. The vendor changed its name because a vendor was acquired. And they'll go in and change it. And so now we, sometimes we've inherited three sets of changes, but the people who received the information received stale data. And now you have to recreate who it went to and getting them the correct information. And what's, that seems sort of like, did, it, did anybody catch that? Did that create a problem? Or it I guess, can, I, I it, guess it could. It can, depending on the materiality of the changes. Mm -hmm. So if you're changing the investment strategy or the people that are managing your money change, it has an effect right. on the decision process of the recipient. Another interesting um, incident that I've experienced with a client, there's a few, actually, I could go on and on about this. This, this is a fun topic. It is a fun it's topic. Good. I do want it's to stay good. on this because I want to, I kind of want to expose the pitfalls that somebody will say, oh, you know, I, so okay, we're, so we're, we noted. Become the, we become the TMZ of the private fund industry with this question. <laughs> That's what we do. So <laughs> I had another situation where a client launched in the course of 10 years, five different funds. And as a lawyer, when I'm launching a new product for a manager that has several products, as we update language or commercial terms may evolve or liquidity features or other aspects, you can you, each fund theoretically stands on its own, but if you're offering a suite of products, you may want them to be uniform. So we're on like fund three or fund four of a client. And the, the language used to determine the valuation of the net asset value Evolved, but evolved slowly over time, mm. just due to commercial changes. So we're on a call with a third-party administrator, and I, and I asked a question, which um, I didn't, ex I didn't, I had fear, but didn't expect the response that I would get. I was like, "Look, please confirm that you're applying the net asset value language of each fund to each of the fund's own accounts, and you're not using the language of one fund for all of the fund's accounts." I got a yes, only to receive an email the following day that they restate NAV because they applied the same language to all the funds across the board, but the language um, wasn't accurate in how they applied it. We had another situation with a third party administrator recently where investors redeemed and there's a holdback until the end, until the following year, usually when an audit is completed and you get, whether it's 5% or 10% back that's held back in case they, in case there was an issue in the valuation, mm -hmm. because once you give all the investor all their money back, you're hard pressed to get it back if you overpay them. Yeah. And otherwise the remaining investors suffer really the asset manager most likely will have to uh, incur the loss. In this case, the administrator is supposed to segregate that holdback money from the rest of the portfolio. In this situation, they didn't do it. Manager invested those assets and those assets should not be at risk. And those assets were lost. Oh, so nice. these are failures by counterparties. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You want more? Yeah. Okay. Um, an area of risk. So we do background checks on all of our clients, not for litigation related reasons uh, or economic reasons, meaning we're not, we're not doing it to determine the economic viability of our clients. It's really to determine more 
whether there's anything that we need to disclose in their biography, civil or criminal actions, and also to verify their educational history. One of the red flags, not only did I learn this when I was at the SEC, but we represent um, many family offices and investors as well at SATUS. And one of the um, learning curves you develop in this industry is anything in a bio that is exaggerated or puffery tends to be an indication that the person is more likely to commit fraud. Mm. So wow. there's times where somebody says they graduated college and our background check proves otherwise. What do you do? What's your response? The, it, it, the answer, it depends on the facts. Mm -hmm. But I do know 10 years ago, there was a big firm being acquired. This was not a client. And I want to identify the firm or the person. So um, any name you want to come up with, you, you can come up with, but it's your guess. In this case, person's been in the industry for 20 years, was at an institution. Another institution was acquiring this institution. They ran background checks and they realized that the person who said they graduated from, I don't remember, it was grad school or college, never graduated. And oh. that, that lie went undetected for 20 years. So this person was a CFO, I believe, or COO. Wow. So... Um, the other thing is principal transactions or conflicts of interest, huge areas of risk, or people exaggerating performance. So another situation that I've witnessed or been a party to was um, wrote offering documents for a client, and the manager made certain representations of our marketing documents that they did not share with us. And the marketing documents made a representation that they'd only trade securities within X, Y, and Z. And they raised hundreds of millions of dollars from just a few investors. Wow. And they did not do what they said they were going to do in the marketing deck. So the marketing deck and the offering documents were not correlated. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you generally, and that's the risk people run when they might outsource certain things or do it yourself. There's no Home Depot for the private fund industry. It's not do right. it yourself. Mm -hmm, it's, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's then your buyer beware if you're going to be a do it yourself kind of human. So right. it's the big, the big issue fundamentally is what I'm getting to is managers may engage law firms that look great on paper, but the economics of the law firm's billing rates do not match up with either the stomach of the manager wanting to pay it or the economics of the firm. And as a result, they hesitate to call their counsel, which following that line tends to lead to bigger problems. So that's an ill fit to begin with. I would completely you know. agree, but people don't want to admit it. And, wow. and the ill fit may not be just based on AUM. It just might very well be. It violates, their, it, it shocks their system as mm -hmm. an individual. Yeah. But your lawyer and your auditor and your administrator really should be people you were close with, really should be people you meet with once or twice a year, if nothing more than a, a medical checkup. Mm -hmm. Because there are things that you may not as a manager realize really do require attention. And right. you may not be right when you think about the urgency of the attention that's needed. So has anything ever really, what's really shocked you or surprised you like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm dealing with this. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> it's, um, there are people that definitely live in a world where they like to put their head in the sand. Mm. And you can warn them and you can advise them. And at some point, if they don't want to listen, because not only do I suggest that they look at me as a business partner, but I certainly look at them as a business partner. And if that's not a fit, then we really shouldn't be working together. And so what's one of the best cases you've worked on? Oh, there's so you're many. most proud of. Well, let's see. In 08, we did the acquisition of Citigroup's assets by Skybridge. That was several billion dollars. Um, I mean, really, there's a whole bunch. We worked with Bill Miller when he was leaving Led Me after he left Led Mason, who launched a fund at, at um, shortly after Bitcoin became viable 
And so he was one of the earlier investors in Bitcoin. So that was a great learning experience. But really, it, it's um, I'm really lucky in the sense that many of my clients I really do like and I get together with. They come into my home and I and we learn from each other. What and what do I learn? Not every lawyer, I, I I believe I have a good bedside manner. I certainly care. I pride myself on being responsive and having empathy for our client situations. But having learned all of the different personality types on Wall Street has been very empowering. And when I first practiced law, and I don't know if you've had this experience in this industry more than any other industry that I've seen so far, there's a lot of paranoia that goes on in the, in the asset management industry about communicating openly with people, right? So everything's very confidential to who are you associating yourself with? Who are you doing business with? And when I used to think that paranoia was unnecessary or blown out of proportion, years later, I, I saw their side of that paranoia where people find out about your trades and they try to... Um, short your, your long positions. You'll see that when managers are going or winding up their firm, if people can figure out what they're trying to do in the marketplace, they might take the opposite end of the position, harming the manager that's trying oh. to liquidate the portfolio. But conversely, it's who you're communicating with and the, and the types of communications you're having because a regulatory examination, even if you win, is a loss in many cases because it's expensive. It's stressful. Just boil it down to a simple life experience many of us had. You're driving on your car and the police pull you over. I don't know about you, and I'm not, I don't have anything I'm hiding in my trunk, and I don't have any broken taillights, and there's no drugs riddled in the car. So in my mind, I'm a, I'm a clean, upstanding citizen, and I have no reason to be afraid, but yet I start to palpitate, and you get nervous because you don't know what they might know. So it's the same thing with the SEC or FINRA or the NFA. It's the best offense is a strong defense and it's doing things as best as you can by the book. And I say as best as you can because it's it's very hard, if not um, impossible, to be 100% compliant at all times on every day in every manner. There, there can be minor non-material um, things that you can improve upon. So we strive for perfection, but perfection may not be attainable. And then just to give you a simple explanation, how would all the big shops end up being fined at, at, by the government? Like Blackstone or BlackRock or you name it. And they've got huge teams of lawyers and, and they do, and they uh, they have every reason to do everything they can by the book. So it's a very, very, very hard, high burden to me. Absolutely. This is kind of a, um, I, I, this is a question I've been getting a lot from newer managers and I'm wondering myself if some, some legislation has changed, but is it, is it no longer, can you no longer use hypothetical performance or can you? It's kind of a boring question, but it is it's, one that I get a it's lot. It's not a boring question. And what I would tell you is there are nuances to your question. And I would tell you that our regulatory and compliance team would be better served to answer that question. But one of the things I can tell you from my experience with the SEC and also seeing and reading about regulatory enforcement cases, um, it's a high area of risk, performance attribution. And it's cons it, it, it seems to be Periodically, it evolves and interpretations of how best to present data might get interpreted differently. What I, one of the things with regard to areas of risks for managers, because implying that is usually like a governmental risk, right? The SEC. I would say your biggest area of risks, I put them into four categories. Your greatest risk is the risk of your relationship with your partner if you have one. So having a very well-documented operating agreement or partnership agreement or shareholders agreement and routinely going through, it, especially as your ownership may evolve, that's your greatest area of risk, a divorce of your partner. Second greatest risk is employees. 
a, an employee doing something that went rogue and despite mm -hmm. your supervisory capabilities you know people are always going to commit crimes despite the supervision uh and they find nefarious ways to do it so that's our second greatest area of risk third greatest area of risk i would say it probably ties between investors and counterparties and then the last which is the one people seem to focus on are the regulatory risks with the SEC, the NFA, and FINRA, depending on what you're doing in the marketplace. So when I went back to it, puffery or hyperbole in your marketing documents, your offering documents with regard to performance. And, and I understand your hypothetical your question regarding the hypothetical data, but I would say that um, there's so many nuances to the information and how it's presented. And one of the other common mistakes I'll get from people like, hey, can you just send me the standard disclaimers? We don't want to send you our marketing document. Like, we don't want to spend the money on it. You know, just give us that boilerplate. Because apparently yeah. Google wasn't working for them that day and they couldn't go online to pull it up. Because of really standardization of risk factors. Yes, you may start with a subset of risk factors that we're going to add to your document, but it's tailored and nuanced to specifically what you are doing. That's why in part I'm hesitating to answer on also the hypothetical, because no matter what I say, people are going to read into what they want to hear. I wasn't sure if something changed where um, someone said to me, I heard we're no longer allowed to use it. And I said, my understanding is that you can use it, but you just have to say that it's hypothetical and you have to put, you have to have disclaimers that say how you calculated it, and that it is hypothetical, that it's not live performance and so on and so on. I, I wasn't sure if it was that yeah. you can't use it anymore. If there was some there, new there legislation. Are, there are a range of nuances, which is why I'm hesitating to respond to that question, that I don't want to give an incomplete response and then have somebody go and rely upon what we're discussing here, only to feel like maybe something didn't go right. Right, right. I can understand that. Yeah. So what are some, what are some evolving you know, new trends or developments that you're keeping an eye on right now? So one of... Um, one of the newer trends, I don't want to say it was a newer trend, but the IRS brought a case in December of last year is with regard to structuring the investment manager as a limited partnership, thereby saving the principles of the firm a tax that's roughly 3%. That's a self-employment tax. So it's trying to see if the commercial trends change there. The subcoming week, I am going to be discussing at a conference AI, the, the regulation of AI and the risks of AI. So that's an area that's developing. Mm -hmm. An obvious trend or concern for those clients that are engaging in crypto transactions is where the SEC and the CFTC fall on this um, and whether laws will be rewritten to support is crypto a security. Again, I thought that was all settled. You know what? If you go, if you go and look at the news, it's, it's still not completely settled. Wow. So speaking of crypto, um, what's your, what's your feeling on, um, SBF? So, uh, I was asked to comment on this, uh, last week, uh, in CNBC. Um, it, it was a horrible occurrence. I personally think the sentencing was fair. The defense wanted six and a half years. The prosecutor wanted 40 to 50 years. And if we look at related, as much as you can relate one action to another, Madoff got over 100 years. Jeff Skilling got received 24 years. Elizabeth Holmes received 11 years. So 25 years means he's not as horrible as Madoff. He's in the Jeff Skilling camp. And, and then Elizabeth Holmes, apparently according to society, or at least the judge, uh, wasn't so bad. So it falls within the range of acceptability. One of the things I found fascinating is comment by one of the other, actually it was comment by Madoff's lawyer, that this serves to frighten people from committing similar crimes. And I would say that's uh, not accurate to my experience and conversations I've had with people who have committed crimes and I'm not talking about our clients. I'm just talking about rather like people I've met along the way that would come to me for guidance, never wanted to hire us, and then just didn't listen to me and ended up having a problem on their hands. While they were afraid of prosecution, 
I don't think it enters into their head when they're engaging it. I think it's more the embarrassment of it becoming a headline and, and less about the jail sentence. I've never, and I've never met somebody who says, well, I would steal the money, but for the fact, based on my analysis, I get 20 to 30 years. <laughs> no, nobody, it's a slippery slope from what I can tell. It's. Do you, you know, think that there was really malice you know, that he was, he really committed fraud. Did he get charged with fraud? Well, one of the things that the judge said was, or, or concluded was he engaged in perjury and witness tampering. But it was also expressed that he lacked remorse. So yeah, there, yeah, there is, there, I believe the conviction included fraud. Mm -hmm. and, it, and whether it serves as a deterrent, I don't think, people who are engaging in the slippery slope at the very beginning of that slippery slope think they're ever going to go that far down the rabbit hole. So I think that's really when you're dealing with the human condition in mind that if you really are looking at it in that regard, I, I think that's the problem. It's um, do people graduate from like from lower levels or, or smaller infractions to greater because they're covering up like the web of lies. Yeah. So I, I think as a, the biggest deterrent, I think, is really the embarrassment within the community in which people live. Because that's the one that seems to be the most relatable. Yeah. I mean, I it seemed like he didn't. I, I guess the deterrent, you know, for a charge like this is like if they kind of think to themselves, well, I'm not really doing anything wrong. You know that that slippery slope just keeps going because they're not identifying with it being wrong. There's a lot of malfunctions that go through people's heads. <laughs> For sure, it's I can't relate to that mindset. Yeah, that's a I, whole different ball game. There, that's like, you know, there's some, you know, there's what I'm trying to uncover here today is like the things you you don't even know that you don't know. You know to 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 prevent you from going into, but then there's, you know, malice and fraud is intentional, bad juju. That's a whole different ball game from, look, don't do these things because, you know, you need to make sure of this, this, and this is, is but a, that's what a the different person. By the way, that, that's what the community theoretically is for, at least in this industry, with having a tight-knit community of lawyers, auditors, and administrators, and a range of other vendors too. Prime broker is that, one of the red flags would be if all of a sudden you see a change of all the service providers. And I don't know if somebody, if if we or our, our contemporaries or our counterparties were to fire people, whether they would even acknowledge the fact that they were fired. Rather that, my guess is many of those people would be like, well, we they charged too much, so we switched. Or we weren't getting a good response time, so we engaged somebody else. But if somebody is routinely changing vendors... They're that covering would, something up. That would concern me as an investor. Mm. And so now on the flip side, flip side, what's what's your ideal client? What would be your favorite type of client that wouldn't do that type of I, thing? I, well, and then I know this may not sound realistic, but it is because my, like I said, I'm a people pleaser. So my motivation getting in the industry and what I do is really I, I enjoy when clients enjoy the experience, what I find I don't enjoy is when I'm being commoditized, where mm -hmm. it's only about the cost. If every time the person reaches out to you, it's about the cost and every bill is negotiated, it it's a, causes me to believe they don't trust me or don't mm -hmm. trust my colleagues. So trust is a two-way street because often the professionals are also deep pockets. Like think about the accounting firms, they get sued all the time mm -hmm. because they're on the hook if they didn't catch something in many cases, despite doing their, the best job they can, and they're not the ones on average or, or that are engaged in fraud or something inappropriate. So every vendor should, if they're not, and probably most of them are, as you look at the risk associated with the relationship, am yeah. I finding out things from other parties that I'd really rather hear from my client? Are they doing things on their own? Are they using so many law firms that it's like the Tower of Babel where the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is dealing with? Yeah. Um, those are the main things that go through my head. But it's, mm -hmm. 
I don't want any of our clients to ever feel commoditized or rushed. And I know when I'm consuming services and goods, I don't want to feel that way. I don't want to feel I'm commoditized. I'm just a number. You want so, people to value your service. Completely agree. And I want I want them to value my service and I want them to feel that we value the relationship, Yeah. which we really do. And I think because this is a very entrepreneurial environment at Satis, most of my, I, I would say all my colleagues, but I'll go with, because I'm a lawyer using qualified terms, I would say the super majority, most, if not all, really have an appreciation for the relationship we share with our clients. We want them to have a good experience. Now, I'm, I have to expect there are some people you can never satisfy, and we've all encountered those types of people. Those are not always, those aren't good relationships. And they sure. exist. I mean, I, I've seen them when I'm at the counter buying like a, a card for somebody. I, I literally had an experience. I went to go buy a card during the holidays. And the woman in front of me got upset with the woman at the counter because in New York City, if they take a bag, you have to charge them five cents. It's, not for, it's, it's a law for the environment, right? To, to reduce use of bags and, and have people use permanent bags that they can carry things in as opposed to disposable. The woman got really upset over a nickel. <laughs> Find out that the woman at the counter started to cry because her aunt died that morning. And then the woman proceeded to berate her to say, well, why did you come to work if there's a death in your family? Not appreciating the fact this person needs to make a living. And then after all that for the nickel and berating the woman, she then returned the card. Okay. By the way, you know, and this is not something I routinely do, but I am proud of. The next day I came in and I gave that woman a hundred dollar bill. At the and I just wanted to say, not everybody, every, not all people in the world are like that and that she's appreciated. So that was one of my That's really, nice. like really good moments. But the point is that person at the register is reflective of a small, hopefully a small percentage of society. I don't want to work with that kind of client. And yeah. I don't think anybody would. Right. It's a, it's a yeah. buzz kill. We're, right. we're in this together. Yep. And so yep. the other thing is um, like success stories. When one of our clients really liked this client, funny enough, I talked to him in a launch. I believe I talked to him in a launching a fund and he's crushing it, doing a great job. And we worked on a seed deal. He, he's got great returns. He's probably one of the nicest people I know. It's great to see good things happen to good people. And so that feeling is really nice. Or it's really nice to have relationships with clients for 20 years. I just had dinner with a client who set up a real estate fund for her, just finished building a hotel here in the city. And even though I'm like a thousand years older than he is, you know, <laughs> plastic surgery probably worked for me. Anyway, it was really nice to spend time and just catch up. So it's nice to mark the time with a lot of clients. And it's the same way with even within the industry, even lawyers with against other from other law firms it's it's nice to be in that tight-knit community yes it is and i i can totally relate to that because there's some clients that i just love working with them there's an energy a, a synergy and an energy that is um when you're aligned it's it's just sort of a perfect experience i'm not perfect but you know no, it's just, it's, and so i am um, i was listening to a podcast that reviewed David Ogilvy's book. I think that was meant for internal distribution. And fundamentally, it was, you want to make your job fun, not, um, you want to minimize the stress as best as we're able to. You can't get it to zero. And there's some days that just aren't great from a stress perspective. But people do their better job when they're happy. And so you would think those few clients that are never happy that are probably complaining about almost everybody they deal with, haven't looked in the mirror to reflect, maybe they're not the problem. And so it's so it goes back to the first question, work with people that you relate to, that you trust, that speak the language in a manner similar to you, that you don't feel you're commoditized by. And it doesn't have to be somebody you want to go out and have a drink or a meal with. That, I'm not suggesting that. Hopefully you have at least a dog if you don't have friends floating Wall Street for the most part. <laughs> um, but that really does make a difference because it's really all about trust. It, 
businesses do far better when there's a higher level of trust. So it would stand to reason if you do not trust your vendors, you're better served working with people who you trust. Yeah, absolutely. So, so and, and, and the law is only one variable to it. Sorry to interrupt the Jan. What do you mean? Well, meaning, I'll give you an example um, that may not necessarily be on point, but it was a learning lesson. So one of my earlier clients, right after we founded Sadis, was another lawyer who was launching, funny enough, this is in 1997, the person was really ahead of the game, a um, cyber security firm. And I found out that at his prior business, he ran these tax, they ran these tax shelters and they were fined a million dollars by the IRS. So I'm 30 years old and, I, and I'm like, well, I guess you'll never do that again, right? And he goes, what are you talking about? We made 5 million, we got fined a million. I do that every day of the week. <gasps> it, wasn't a criminal, it wasn't a criminal act, but the point is law is just one variable, one risk metric. I'm not advocating breaking law, but it puts it in perspective. We are here to guide people to give them mo the most likely outcome we believe based on all of our experience. But I'm not their parent. I'm, I am I do not harbor any anger in the event a client doesn't listen. And I, I used to work with somebody at a prior firm that if the client did not listen to this lawyer, he literally never wanted to speak to the client again. Wow. He took it very personally. And I'm not talking about somebody breaking the law and, and that I get. If somebody's going to break the law, we are not going to aid and abet them. We would terminate the relationship. And we've had to do that um, every so often. But it's really a team effort. And so you want to work with people that you really want on your team, that you would want on the foxhole with you. Yeah. If you terminated a relationship with somebody, let's just say you terminated, have you ever witnessed somebody that you terminated a relationship with like go to jail and you were like i knew that was going to happen yeah really yeah, yeah really. oh you wow seem you seem shocked there's people who terminated and there's here's a story that i can tell that maybe 15 years ago i had a client come in and they came in with two giant binders of structure and other agreements that they'd entered into with a, that a, a consultant had drafted up for them. After we reviewed them, and I had um, a subsequent meeting to discuss the results of what we reviewed, and this is as strange as it gets, and I've had a bunch of strange go on in the last you know, 30 years of my life, I was like, I'm pretty sure you guys are running a Ponzi scheme. But if you want, I will go to the SEC with you, and we can fall on a sword and it's going to be the best result you're going to get. The response I got, which is not shocking, was thanks, but we don't like your guidance. Five years later, I get a call from the Department of Justice. We'd like you to talk about this um, client. I'm like, I can't, attorney client privilege. Two years later, ends up being they asserted a defense that they relied upon legal guidance, which basically means they waive attorney client privilege. I then had to testify in court. And um, so I have a jury there, a judge there, Department of Justice there. And they're like, well, did you write a memo to the file about this Ponzi scheme? I'm like, well, no, if they said they weren't going to pay, what's the purpose of documenting file? But in my billing records, it was, I, which they had received and never like countered. I indicated that I communicated to them we're running a Ponzi scheme. So that they went to jail. And the only reason I can share that is because it's a public record. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but yeah no there's time where you'll meet people and something doesn't add up it's like those movies where somebody's up to something and then after the truth gets revealed they're like oh now it makes sense mm -hmm. but it's not just even with clients it's it's with counterparties i remember meeting with mark dreyer who is a lawyer he was a 499 park which was the old bloomberg building and I remember to go up to a meeting and he, it was a strange morning and it's a giant floor and he was the only person on the whole floor and it ended up being, he was making certain economic representations that completely confused me. And then a couple years later, it comes out that he committed fraud. Oh, wow. So it could be lawyers, it can be accountants, it can be administrators. If it's too good to be true, it often is. If you don't understand what you're getting, then 
either don't do it or hire somebody that can walk you through and explain it to you. So, the, I mean, all these, we hear all these sayings. These are things that your mother tells you on your way to, you know, before you leave the door to go to school in the morning. But they really are true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like you could see red flags, handwriting on the wall. You know something bad is adrift. Now, dating is far more stressful with the red flags, <laughs> the attorney-client <laughs> relationship. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, you've been with Satis for a while. What are you getting excited about? What's new? What's coming that you're excited about? Oh, actually, there's a lot. I mean, as we continue to grow, it's really great to see the young lawyers here and to know that each of us is having an influence on how they look at their career. Um, we've recently expanded into Miami. We had a partner start there about a, I'd say nine months ago. So we're, we're continuing to grow and to add other lawyers into the practice group. Um, those are some of the more exciting things. And our litigation team's been really active on some really interesting cases. So I'm exciting to see them get their day in court, as I say. That is exciting. The things I would like to see, and I don't know if this trend will reverse. So ever since 2008, there has been a, there's been a movement from, um, of people who are allocating money more towards institutions, right? It, there's this, um, I don't know, I don't know how accurate this is or isn't based on the data, because I don't know if all data gets reported, which I assume it doesn't, but that 90% of the assets go to 10% of the largest players in the marketplace, mm -hmm. I heard which, has three. On, which has been put pressure on emerging managers. Yeah. So I'm hopeful that that trend will reverse if everything is cyclical. Hard to tell, but I'm hopeful on that. Uh, a friend of mine in prime brokerage told me once that it takes seven years of being in business before you really just start to hit your stride. So for managers that are launching, they're two or three years and they're they're tightening their belt and they're a little concerned that they haven't raised significant assets. Obviously, it may make sense to revisit how they're just trying to distribute their product. But longevity and having a long runway increases the likelihood of your achieving success. Yes. Yes. So important. Yeah. So I always ask, I often ask managers, you know, despite your, your cost constraints and your, your cash burn, do you have the ability to stay in business for seven years? I bet a lot of them don't know that right up front. I, I mean, I get the feeling that they're like, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, but that's that's if they're, it, it depends on what their expectation is from cash flow from their business. Mm -hmm. If you're going in and saying, look, my cash burn is X a month, which is Y a year, you multiply that by seven, I have three three X seven in my bank account. That's not money at risk or in um, really low risk types of cash equivalents. If you have a high expectation that you're going to launch and have a material launch, like you, you hope for the best, but plan for the worst. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When I started Satis, I had 30,000 in business and my twins were home with their mother and I had a mortgage and may have had $10,000 in the bank. And I had a backstop of family members, but you know, when I said jokingly that anxiety goes away after 10 or 15 years, that was my experience. But I bet um, at that time you didn't have a seven year plan with that 10 grand in the bank. You're just like. <laughs> seven year plan. No, I had no, I, I, I asked family members, could you cover my mortgage for the, this period of time in the event? I don't, I have a tough time making money. Yeah. So I did have some safety nets that I went and developed prior to launching the firm, but Somewhere early days, I built up my cash position because I never wanted to make decisions based on fear, based on fear of cash flow, uh, because there is a gland in your brain that secretes a hormone when you're afraid, right? It evolved when we were cave people and the bushes shook and we didn't know if we were going to be attacked or if there's a little tiny bird or some larger animal. And it minimizes your cognitive abilities where it simplifies it to flight or fight. Well, go forward a couple hundred years or thousand years or thousands of years, we still have that gland in our brain. So when people get afraid, they don't make the best decisions. Mm. And so, and we all respond to different stimuli. So for me, 
minimizing that risk of cash flow. But and we built up redundancies within the firm so that if somebody departed, it wasn't like, oh my God, what do we do? So and it evolves. It evolves as we age, it evolves as our situations change. So being aware of what those triggers are and then planning for them on top of all the other things you're doing in a business help. And that's why in part having really good advisors around you can help you think through those things because we all have blind spots. So this is my final question. So now you've mentioned a couple of really important things like carefully choose your attorney, have a really solid relationship that you enjoy, have a, um, runway, you know, cash flow runway. What's one more final best piece of advice? So I'm listening. So I've been listening to this podcast where he reviews um, books by famous people. And the one that I had mentioned earlier about Ogilvy, it was um, intuition. And our intuition is far more important than we might give it credit for. Men tend to be worse at intuition than women, based on what I've read. So um, I'm not I'm not personally admitting defeat to that, but <laughs> I know that that's the common belief out there. It's if your gut is telling you something, maybe pause and listen to your gut. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you don't have that relationship with certain people, it's in real estate. It's location, location, location. In this game, it's relationship, relationship, relationship. It's the same thing as it goes with your investors as a manager. Those people who have a deeper relationship with their investors, it will have a longer time usually to invest the assets. So that goes about based on your ability to communicate proactively with your investors as opposed to hiding and put your head in the sand. So um, I would leave you with that as well. Relationships the world is based on a relationships and it's a relationship business. This is very much a relationship business. Absolutely. Well, so thank, thank you so much. much. Thank you. This was yeah. so great. So many pearls of wisdom here. I really appreciate your time today, Ron. Well, I earned my gray hair. At least I'd like to think I did. <laughs>